Our lectionary gospel reading for this morning comes to us from the 10th chapter of Matthew's gospel, verses 40 to 42. Listen to God's word. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of a righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cool water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, you call us to welcome others in your name. As we hear your word, we pause to thank you for welcoming us as your own. Draw near to us now that my words, that our meditation, that this moment in worship will guide us in all moments of our lives. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our text for today is simple enough. It is brief, to the point, and delivers what seems to be a very clear message. It is good to be welcoming. In fact, the text tells us that it is so good to be welcoming that there is a divine reward associated with hospitality in God's name. And this reward, in fact, will be proportionate to the welcome one extends. Now, our lectionary offers just these verses for our gospel. They are an excerpt of a larger chapter of guidance Jesus gives to his disciples as he prepares to send them out into the world. The one who welcomes a prophet will earn a prophet's reward. The one who welcomes a righteous person will, by association, be rewarded as one who is righteous. And if all you can do is share a cup of cold water with a little one, you will retain any reward that is you. Welcome others. God will notice. It will be a win-win for all. Now, I don't know if it's because I'm a mom to a six-year-old aspiring race car driver, scientist, architect, attorney, but <clears throat> when I read this passage, a part of me could imagine Jesus in the parking lot of Target, turning his head over his shoulder and saying to his disciples, some, setting some ground rules for them just before they head into the store. Okay, friends, he says, listen up. You are heading into a public place on your own. And everything I have been teaching you about is going to be on display. We've got a lot of work to do, and so you need to go to different aisles with the list I have given you to get the job done. You're going to need to split up, so I'm not going to be looking over your shoulder. You need to stick to the items on your list, but you need to remember Friends, your actions are not just a reflection of you. They are a reflection of me and of our whole community. So you and of everything I have taught you. So you need to focus not just on what you are doing, 
but how you are doing it. Got it? Be on your best behavior. <clears throat> and if you do just that, there will be a reward waiting for you when you get back in the car. A reward that will reflect just how well you followed my directions. So only you can determine if that reward comes from the dollar bin by the registers or from your favorite toy aisle. Got it? Good. All right. Now I know that years of discipleship cannot be distilled down to a the language a parent might use in the front seat of a car before coaching their kids about heading out into the world. It may even seem inappropriate to use the terms of a meritocracy when speaking of God's call for all of God's disciples to welcome others in God's name. We are Presbyterian, and this call sounds kind of provisional and conditional. It sounds situational and unsure, and it sounds like we're backtracking on more than 500 years of Reformation theology and even more years of biblical scholarship and texts that say that it's not that we earn God's favor by what we do, but rather because God in God's goodness is righteous but not to fear. Living well into our call of discipleship is not a mark of salvation by works. Jesus is reminding his, his disciples though that discipleship is about more than just following. It's about living what you've learned. Now that is a whole other sermon into itself, but rest assured, we have been saved by grace through faith. We have been forgiven and claimed. We have been called and sent as disciples of Jesus Christ because God's love is so wide that it includes us too. But let's face it. The language of reward in this text is in some ways easier to understand than God's grace, right? We do our homework as we're coming up through school, yes, to learn, but also because we want to earn A's and B's on our report card when we can. We do our best at our job because we want to contribute to our common mission but we also do so because we need to earn a living. There will be career advancement, promotions, our own livelihood at stake. We paint the trim on our house in the hopes of getting a higher offer when we go to sell our home. And we even use currency of exchange in our relationships whether we make that clear or not, right? There's that time that we pick up our friend at the airport because they picked us up the last time we went on a trip, and we hope they're going to water our plants when we go away at the end of the summer. But Nat Matthew reminds us in this text, as Matthew reminds us through the entire gospel, he writes that God's economy is not like that. Now see, Jesus' words do not issue a call that reinforces the cultural framework of his day or of ours, but he challenges our impulse to do only that which will yield us a, re a reward in return. And he calls us to do the humbling, challenging work of loving others in all ways. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't point out what many of you have already probably noticed yourself when I read this passage. We are a Matthew 25 church, and these few verses we read for today might remind us of the longer parable later in Matthew's gospel. 
the one in which Jesus paints a picture of a final day of judgment, in which God opens the gates of heaven to some, calling to God's self those who have fed the hungry, clothed the naked, visited the imprisoned, sheltered the homeless, and welcomed the stranger. And it is only when they arrive at these pearly gates that the followers of Christ learn a surprising twist. Every time they offered such care, they were serving Christ himself. Jesus says that he himself is situated with those who have no means to pay back a debt, with those who have no food of their own to share, with no door to open, just as Jesus himself is greeted when one of his very own disciples receives the welcome of a stranger they may meet along the way. By extending hospitality to even one with desperate needs or unsavory qualities or nothing to offer in return, we, as Christ's disciples, get to experience more fully how God loves. And this is not because God has told us so, but because in doing so, we might receive just a taste of what it might be like to love like God loves, even just a crumb ourselves. The welcome we extend is the reward because it is in this exchange of radical hospitality that true love abounds. And so we practice what Jesus preaches. We, as a church family, open wide our doors. We do things like hang rainbow banners. We pray and discern and act to see what we might do to extend racial reparations in our current context, not because these efforts in and of themselves are the end or even the means of discipleship, but because we know that at the crux of our call is to live out the welcome to which we are called. And so we identify a starting point and we take that step and then we put the next foot forward by God's grace. We discern and we pray and we work together and we keep on moving, knowing that with each step, we will go further away from our own privilege and power and preference and closer to the needs of another. And by heading in this direction, we know we are heading right in the direction of the heart of God's own self. It was a few weeks into my college career that I met a sophomore named Brett. We were walking across campus and had a mutual friend and so we both said hello and then we arrived at the doors of our campus center. I got there first so I reached up my hand and pulled open that door and invited Brett to walk through. Brett's reply was, oh no, a gentleman should open the door for a lady. So he stepped and held open the door. I love your faces because you have known me for a long time. This is not gonna go well, right? <laughs> <coughs> Brett opens the other door and says, no, please allow me. Please walk through the door I have opened for you. I said, no, no, no. I got here first. I would like to welcome you through the door I have opened. For it is not only a man who can hold a door open for a woman, but a woman, in fact, has the strength and the, the ability to open a door for a man and for herself. So please, go. 
Oh, no, 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 he said. <laughs> I just cannot do that. It is not what I was taught. And so we stood there for quite some time until this mutual friend went to the next set of doors and pulled it open and said, Brett, go. And I walked through the door I had opened for myself. Now, I will tell you, this passage reminds me of that moment and reminds me that hospitality is about more than opening doors. It is about creating the circumstances through which acceptance and trust and respect and honor and mutual service and love can thrive so that another person feels that it is worth the risk to step through that open door. It is about more than simply tolerating that someone is different from us, but knowing them and loving them and getting to know them some more, even in their difference. And what's more, well, a true welcome is valuing those who are different from us so much that we are willing to step through the thresholds of doors ourselves, stepping out of our comfort zone, through doors held open by those who are different than us with humility and hope that by doing so, we and we might be changed. Barbara Brown Taylor says this, she names that to offer hospitality, well, that's one thing, and it's a good thing. But it puts you in charge. Receiving, she says, is something else altogether, especially when you and your religion are used to being in charge. Being a guest can transform you like being a host never can. It levels the playing field. It puts you in receiving mode, which has a lot less ego in it than giving mode. It also accelerates the learning curve as you find yourself in the minority for once, seeing the world through other people's lenses and experiencing them to see the, then expecting them to see the world through yours. I share this quote because here at ELPC, Radical hospitality is a foundation of our mission together. It is a phrase that we selected more than a decade ago to articulate not only our call, but our identity. It guides our work and our worship and our mission together. But we also, I bet, have noticed that the world itself has changed a lot ever since the language of radical hospitality was adopted in our mission statement. To borrow Taylor's playing field image, the goalposts have shifted in both directions and they continue to move. What was radically hospitable 10 or 15 or 20 years ago is no longer considered as radical, perhaps, as it once was. Simply throwing the doors open and saying all oh, are welcome with the promise that there is room in this great sanctuary for all who come inside might not be as brave as it once was. It is no longer a radical act to ordain a sibling who identifies as an LGBTQIA plus person or, or to preside over marriages that have been legal in our state and accepted in our denomination for nearly a decade. It's no longer radical to be an interracial congregation or to be a big steeple church with female pastors. Now these are just and good and foundational to who we are, do not get me wrong. 
and for many Christians in this city and the world afar, these acts are radical and we are on territory to which they would never travel. This part of our identity presses against a status quo held by many who believe otherwise. But that hospitality, but a hospitality that is truly radical, doesn't stay still. It doesn't stagnate. It doesn't pat itself on the back and feel like it's figured everything out. It continually questions. It explores. It longs to do more. It redefines the prescribed limits we've received by our culture. It notices that the rules of the game are always changing and commits to doing the heavy work together of moving those goalposts out of their footings so that the definition of who we are as us never stops growing. Because at our heart, we are all gods. Radical hospitality is more than opening doors. That's a part of it, but not all. It's more than trusting that strangers will find their way inside. It's more than hoping that our good ideas and customs and preferences and vision rubs off on another. Rather, it is striving ourselves to listen and to listen in order to learn. It is willing, it's a willingness to surrender our privilege, our comfort, our egos, so that someone else will know their worth. It means leaving familiar home turf and taking the love of God in Christ out into the world. All right, back to Brett. As I said, we both ended up inside the campus center to which we were headed. And honestly, I do not remember what happened once we got inside. But I do know this. I know that a few weeks later, I sat quietly in the lounge of Walker Annex with my arm around Brett's shoulder as he grieved the loss of George H. Bush's failed run for a second term in the White House. I do know that when my teenage sister was having an especially hard day after my parents had separated, Brett came to my dorm room, keys in hand, and offered to drive me back to Pittsburgh so I could be with her. I do know that even though Brett's full face and ears and neck would blush to a bright beet wed, red if anyone even said the word body, he came with me and my friends to a meeting one Thursday of the Society for the Advancement of Gender Equality because he knew that was important to me. And I would get up at 12.30 in the morning and hear the play-by-play -play of Brett's hockey practice that started on the ice sometime after 10 p.m. I was much younger then and had a much later bedtime. But I would listen to who did what with the puck and how many times they threw off their gloves and got into a fight on the ice because that was how they were working out the day's stress. And then Brett and I signed up together for a liberation theology class. And even as he said in class, why should I question Paul? I mean, Paul is Paul, and Paul's in the Bible, and I am not. He listened when I said, but God gives us minds and hearts and spirits and calls us to love too. And together we wrestled with ancient texts and our own ability to love better and more widely. So the short of it is, I'm kind of glad, in hindsight, that Brett did not walk through my door. I 
it would have been too easy. It would have been polite, but it wouldn't have been authentic. Rather, becoming one of Brett's best friends took hard work. And the effort it took was part of the reward. We both made a decision somewhere along the way. I have no idea when it happened because it was really a ridiculous choice. That we were going to be friends with someone with whom we had clear differences and disagreements and even discomforts which were known right up front. But in our authenticity, we were able to name that there was so much less fear. We could be ourselves instead of walking on eggshells. We could listen to learn, and that didn't mean we were going to agree. It didn't mean we didn't challenge each other. It didn't mean we didn't call out or call in when the other's behavior or ideas or thoughts were disingenuous or caused us harm. But it meant that we knew we were loved and we were free and ready to grow. ELPC, friends, is at an exciting moment as a church. It might not feel exciting. It might feel uncomfortable or strange. But as we continue to live into the essence of our call, even as we do the hard work of preparing for a new pastor, we find ourselves in a season of both introspection and action. A season of discerning what it is that we must let go of and what it is to which we need to cling. It is complicated and difficult, but it is a season that will help us refine and clarify our identity as individuals and as a community of faith, and to recommit ourselves to our shared mission and embrace together our sense of call. As such, I share the words one commentator writes on this passage with hope and a challenge. She says, perhaps we should warn those in our new member class that it matters far less whether they like it here than that they think of themselves as sent out into the world to be Christ's and to meet Christ's, to risk for the sake of love and justice, reputation, persecution, irreparable family rifts, to face the wolves of insatiable greed, rugged individualism, and exploitive power, to lose their life, to find it, indeed, to inherit the kingdom. Then we are being Christ to them, and they become Christ's to us. I am filled with wonder as I imagine this next season of our ministry together both in the interim here and now and in the day and when we call a new pastor. As we do this hard work of living into our call, I earnestly pray that we will not only hear but live into the challenge before us in Christ's words today, and that we will be curious enough and hopeful enough and gutsy enough and faithful enough to figure out just what radical hospitality looks like together in this moment and the next, so that we might do that beautiful, messy work of welcoming others in Christ's name. Friends, siblings, may it be so. Amen.